Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, I'm gonna to be doing a five-year update of my beloved flighty, the Flightmaster, and that is today's wristwatch check. You join me here in the beautiful, <laughs> some of you may disagree, but for me, it's beautiful. It's gray, it's overcast, it's wet, it's cold, but it's my favorite. We are, of course, talking about the English countryside. I absolutely adore it, and where better than to test such a robust, and versatile watch. Um, so I'm going to be asking in this video, instead of um, just a you know straightforward review, I'm going to be talking about its history, its development, uh, why it's become such a revered classic, and uh, why it's also coincidentally my favourite Seiko. So without further ado, I'm going to carry on on my walk. Uh, so let's roll the intro and get into it. Seiko has a long history of making pilot watches, starting with the massively iconic kamikaze watches of World War II. However, the story with the Flightmaster starts with Amiga, in fact. The name was first used by the Swiss brand when the Flightmaster line was introduced in 1969 and was the first Amiga with the movement reference 910 designed with the timing needs of pilots in mind. Omega never filed for a trademark of the name and the watch sold badly, so it was subsequently discontinued. Around the same time, Seiko released the reference 61387000, which was an automatic column wheel chronograph with a navy timer style bidirectional rotating slide rule designed for pilots to make the necessary calculations. Despite not having Flightmaster printed on the dial like the Amiga, this was very much the genesis of all following Flightmasters from Seiko, as it was the first chronograph pilot watch with all these features combined. It has now become one of the most sought after by collectors and somewhat overshadowed by the more famous automatic chronograph Seiko made in this golden era such as the legendary Pogue of course with the 6139 or the Kukami and Panda chronographs with the same 6138. The 6138 had a very distinctive cushion case typical of its day and a vertical bicompax layout on the dial with a day-date complication and a 30-minute register. During the 80s, Seiko did away with the slide rule bezel on their pilot chronographs, and the evolution of what we know now as the Flightmaster took a different turn in favor of something simple, but arguably far more important to the history of Seiko pilot watches. In the early 1980s, the military forces of the UK went looking for a new pilot chronograph to replace the Valju 7733 powered chronographs. They had been issued for the previous decade. By this time, Quartz technology had advanced to a level of quality and affordability that made it the obvious choice for the new watch. The company selected to manufacture the new watch was the Japanese company Seiko, marking a departure from the Swiss, American and English brands previously used. And the watch they provided was a fantastic example of everything a Quartz chronograph could be. 7A2871 120, now most often called the Gen 1, Seiko later supplied a second generation in the 90s, was issued to British pilots in October 1984 and was not replaced until November 1990. During that run, the Ministry of Defence issued a total of 11,307 Gen 1 chronographs, making it one of the most numerous chronographs issued to military forces. Like all Seiko 7A28 models, the Gen 1 was a well-designed, functional chronograph with the stopwatch indicators arranged efficiently around the dial, 3 o'clock register measured one-tenth of a second, while the large center ticks incremental seconds. The nine o'clock register records chronograph minutes up to 30. Time is displayed with the standard center hour and minute hands and a continuous 
seconds hand in the bottom register. The 7828 movement, officially introduced by Seiko in 1983, is notable for being the first quartz analog chronograph, meaning the stopwatch hands propelled by a battery powered quartz movement. The 7A28 paved the way for affordable, reliable, stylish quartz analog chronographs that we very much take for granted on the market today. The use of metal gears throughout the movement made it robust, easily repaired, meaning the watches can last a very long time if well maintained. Something that would continue to endure and return with our beloved Flightmaster SNA411. With the proliferation of quartz technology that Seiko was constantly improving, in the early 90s, the most influential ancestor of the Flightmaster was born. The Seiko 7T34 was officially called the flight computer and it was a very fitting name as the watch was one of the most complex and function rich analog quartz pilot watches made so far. To start with the slide rule bezel had returned and Seiko introduced a tri-compax layout with four registers and one even having multiple hands. The 7T34 included multiple time zones, alarm, date and a split time 30 minute chronograph. What is also worthy to note is the 7T38 became available in a wide plethora of styles, colors and versions. And despite being officially called the flight computer, just like so many iconic Seiko watches, they became affectionately called flight masters by their owners and fans. And so Seiko, in a clever move, filed the flight master trademark in 1995. And a few years later, the very first official flight master was released with the name proudly for the first time printed on the dial. But interestingly, in another twist in the story, Seiko, for whatever reason, decided to drop the chronograph complication in favor of a GMT. The slide rule was also discarded in exchange for a 24 hour bi-textured bezel. Not only was this a dramatic departure in function and style, but the watch was also made out of a titanium alloy and powered by a kinetic 5M45 movement and was designed to complement a trio of JDM kinetic land, sea and air, the Seiko Landmaster, the Scuba Master and of course the Flightmaster. This GMT Flightmaster proved unsuccessful in comparison to the previous flight computers and so only a low amount were produced, making this watch extremely rare nowadays. This rarity was not only due to the quantity but also made all the more desirable by its oversized S balanced second hand and its rather quirky design. With the Flightmaster name now in jeopardy of being consigned to the scrap heap, Seiko hedged their bets on a more tried and tested approach. In the late 90s, the current Flightmaster we all know and love was introduced. Like what we saw with the 7T34, an extremely wide variety of colors and styles were released. The slide rule and the chronograph returned, along with many different models utilizing the excellence of the 7T62 and the 7 T92 movements. By now, the cost of production and the quality of the quartz movements had come a long way, and so they were aimed more at the budget entry level market. The choice and breadth of the Flightmaster exploded, and over the next decade, it culminated with perhaps its widest range of versions yet. From solar powered to super affordable Seiko 5 time only, there were many prospect special editions and ultimately coming full circle with the return of an automatic chronograph in the early 2000s. These automatics utilize the impressive in-house caliber 6S37 with a column wheel and 50 hour power reserve. In 2003, a special Flightmaster automatic chronograph was released in a limited edition to mark the 100th anniversary of man's first powered flight in 1903. This Flightmaster was manufactured to commemorate the day the Wright brothers took that historic first flight. So where are we now? Well, let's take it to the studio. Here we are with my beloved flighty, the Flightmaster SNA411. What is the allure of this watch? Why uh, has it got such an appeal? This is not going to be a straightforward review because this has been reviewed to death on YouTube, um, even though my initial review was very very rudimentary in the early days uh, i will go over some of the specifications because it has got to factor into the 
uh, my love affair with this piece. First of all, the size is just perfect. The entirely stainless steel case, uh, despite its short lugs, and it's, it is a 41 millimeter. Sometimes it's stated in listings that it's 42, but it wears a little bit smaller due to the shorter lugs, which are to its detriment, but we'll get onto that in a moment. It just wears perfectly. It's only a smidgen over 12 millimeters tall, even with this pronounced domed hard legs. I love the hard legs. Some people give hard legs a bad uh, rap. I think it's fantastic. It has a beautiful distortion as you move it. Definitely gives a bit more depth um, to that expansive dial. And it's all about the dial. This is one of the most beautiful dials in my opinion. It's um, imponderable to some, but to me, utterly charming. It's something I, I get lost in. There's also many different layers to it, and it has a, almost a kind of black porcelain quality to the glossiness of it. There's a staggering amount of refinement as well with applied markers, applied um, uh, Seiko logo there. Uh, I love the addition of the, uh, if I engage the chronograph, of that playful yellow, that is echoed with the NDC strap, which I'll discuss a little bit later on. As you see with that one fifth of a second sweep to the, uh, it's a split time, I must I must point out as well. And I've erroneously called it a, a Mecha Quartz. It's not actually, it doesn't even have any jewels in it. This is the Caliber 7T62. And if I engage the, uh, with the second pusher there, it, it catches up. So it is a split time. It does have a little bit of a mechanical esque feel to that sweep. In fact, I don't think of a, the, it being a quartz um, at all derisive or, or, or um, a weakness at all. In fact, I think this is the perfect ultimate tool watch. So the 762 is a fantastic movement. I love all the complications and this is definitely something that, that I appreciate about this watch. We have a two-handed sub-dial at the six that doubles as a second time zone and operates as an alarm. We have the seconds at the nine and then a 60 minute uh, register at the 12. We have the date. It is uh, hackable if I um, actually let me just reset. I love that sweep as well. If I pull out the crown all the way, you'll see the seconds has stopped. If I go to the first position, we get a very snappy quick set. Also with this caliber, um, it, it cl uh, clicks over nicely at midnight, but a screw down crown, screw down pushes even, the incredible water resistance, just that just makes it such a, a robust piece. And I've dropped the hard legs. Uh, this is a, a Sega's own proprietary crystal. And as you can see, it's, it's almost flawless. There's a few little scuffs. Unfortunately, you can't poly watch it, but a replacement isn't that difficult. Some people have actually even added Sapphire, which I think is a fantastic upgrade. I find the hard legs uh, very able to take a lot more punishment. It is harder on the Vickers scale compared to your typical acrylic or uh, Hesalite, but obviously nowhere near as um, scratch resistant as Sapphire. Also, I love the functionality of matching the yellow of the chronograph hand to the hand on the sub dial so you know that it corresponds um, the white printing is so crisp and contrasts wonderfully off the black and the, the sloping uh, chapter ring there with all the markings i have seen some qc issues where things don't line up and misaligned uh, markers or the lumi bright not properly applied but i have to say there is much more of a consistency from my experience with these aviation quartz uh, watches compared to some of the automatics, especially the Seiko 5s and the SKX line. It would have been really nice to see if the crown was signed. Um, however, not ne really necessary at the end of the day. The aluminium insert also has a slight sheen. The markings are actually in a silver and the compass markings are in I would say almost the kind of coppery gold. You have that bi-directional bezel, the action to it. It's just the right amount of resistance. It's very secure. Uh, something that's definitely been improved upon from the earlier um, ancestors of this current flight master. One thing that is incredibly impressive is the clarity and precision of printing. We even get little refinements like the steel 
high polish framing the the sub registers and everything is just laid out with such efficiency yes it has a, a almost bewildering amount of complexity which i find charming and beguiling other people are completely turned off yes it is a marmite watch it's not going to be for everybody but if you like something busy this is an incredibly usable piece. So the bezel is obviously designed for in-flight, pre-flight calculations such as ground speed, distance, fuel burn, wind set and other computations. Um, but in everyday life, you can use it to calculate the tip on a bill. So it's, <laughs> it's useful and you also you've got compass markings as well. Combined with the water resistance and the fact that it's such a tough cookie makes it a wonderful do-it-all adventure watch, complemented wonderfully by the parachute um, NDC strap. This is the official NDC strap, the real thing, the real McCoy. This isn't a reproduction. NDC is the only company that um, actually uses uh, real material from, from genuine uh, military uh, surplus uh, parachute strap. The black with the uh, olive, utter perfection. It had to be done and that yellow, that kind of viper stripe yellow just echoes the the uh, uh, bright banana yellow of, of that seconds hand. It has a playful quality to it. I also love the, the screw down pushes. It makes it lockable um, and also gives that extra feeling of security. The loom is, despite its diminutive um, amount, is very, very responsive. When the second hand of the chronograph is at the 12, you do get a sense of orientation. What are the biggest negatives of this watch? Well, undoubtedly the position of the spring bars. It's a 21 millimeter lug width, which is just terribly annoying. Fortunately, the NDC fits it wonderfully. It's a real pain in the um, butt to, to, to get a, even the thinnest of NATO straps in there. Why any watchmaker would ever make a, a lug width in an odd number, I just don't know. And the position of the spring bar hole is so close to the case. It's, it's a real annoyance. I'm not a fan of the bracelet, never have been. Some people love it. I think it's too big, too clunky. It doesn't uh, taper. In fact, it, off the bracelet, it's about 70, just under 80 grams. The bracelet accounts for 100 extra grams of weight. It's very substantial and, 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 and it is secure but it's just so much uh, of a heavy thing also i'm not a fan of the center polished links i think uh, it would have been much better completely brushed and that is something i've never really liked about the the finishing the finishing is as you would imagine of an entry level for seiko it's not the sharpest of edges, the transitions. You definitely notice the, the difference between the mid-range, things like the Saab line, and obviously the higher range. So the, the finishing leaves a lot, lot to be desired. I think it would have been much better in a more utilitarian brushed finish completely, because to me, this is a real tool watch. There is a lovable verisimilitude about this watch. And I have to say the battery has held up far longer than its estimated three-year battery life, even using the chronograph several times a week. But I found that actually uh, <laughs> it's far exceeded that. The accuracy was estimated at plus minus 15 a month. I'm pleased this report is far more accurate than that. Another big negative for me has actually been the 60-minute register. Uh, something that it's more affordable less desired cousins you could say with the 30 minute um, chronograph movements uh, 30 minutes is easier to divide up on the register uh, sometimes it's actually difficult to read how many minutes have, has elapsed especially if you like me you're covered in sweat and doing cardio or something it can be difficult to quickly get a reading at a quick glance because of the complexity of all the features it is a little bit difficult to set and the alarm is not the most of audible of of alarms i would actually say it's more of a reminder it's certainly not going to wake me up in the morning very useful if you have to remind yourself to do something uh, I think is actually more practical to utilize it in that way. It has been somewhat put on the sideline in my collection because of uh, my appreciation for the G-Shock. Also, it's amazing to think that this is entirely in-house. Seiko make all the components. 
even the the quartz crystals are their own quartz crystals it's a, it's a very impressive uh, feat of engineering when this model came out it, it sold very badly it took a while to catch on because people simply didn't know about it people wanted the oversized pieces and even at 41 it was quite conservative uh, in the the heyday of the oversized trend and of course things are going back but this is by no means small i predict that uh, Seiko will bring out a new flight master and hopefully they'll base its design on this i'd love to see a v-shaped layout on the sub dials i just prefer it i really expected this watch would be put on the back burner when i got my navi timer finally one of my grail watches i was so wrong it's certainly got its own feeling yes it might itch that scratch if you're lusting after a navi timer but you don't want to spend the money um, but it's an entirely different feeling. And something that I do appreciate about this, that the dual time zone at the six o'clock is a lot more legible than my Rolex GMT. At a glance, it's far easier to read. This is without a shadow of doubt, uh, one of my favorite watches and I think my favorite Seiko watch. And I've even considered modding it. Some people have done that, but unlike the SKX where I want to improve it. I, I don't want to change anything about this watch and I have considered it many, many times. Um, I never thought I would love a quartz watch uh, for so long and so much. But yeah, the flighty, it just absolutely does it for me. And there we have it. So, uh, yeah, five years. Am I gonna keep it another five years? Definitely. In conclusion, it's all the more endearing to me now because I've, I've learned about its history. I think it's the ultimate grab and go, do it or watch. Its features is, well, it has the functionality essentially of a G-Shock, but in analog form. Seiko really hit it out of the park. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But its imperfections in a certain kind of way add to that ineffable charm that it undoubtedly has. I also think the NDC is the ultimate combination. I don't see myself changing the strap out ever. It's just perfection. The NDC was, as you guys know, was intended for dive watches, but this having 200 meters water resistance, yeah, it kind of fits again, because you can actually, it's a chronograph, it's an aviation chronograph, you can take diving. That is how versatile and tough it is. And also I think it will become a classic, I really do, uh, just as its forerunners have. Do I mind it being a quartz? Absolutely not. Again, this is all about utility. This is where, you know, you want a quartz watch. Uh, although it does have a little bit of that soul with the uh, mechanical one-fifth of a second tick. And now knowing its history, I value it even more. I, I, I feel I appreciate it on a whole nother level. Uh, it's unpretentious, it's not trying to be anything other than its own thing, and yet it has its own lineage and history, and you can see it in the design. I mean, the hands are the same as the handset you see in the very first analog quartz chronograph ever that Seiko famously put out in the 80s. That, let's not forget, James Bond wore one. But the big question is, is it still worth the price? I definitely think it is. I'd be happy to pay even twice as much. I think the, uh, the flight computer, its predecessor, is very much a soft spot in the used market. Prices are rising. I don't think it's been discontinued, but I think if you're on the fence about it, it's definitely better to buy one now rather than when it is discontinued or replaced. Uh, Sega has a bit of a strange history. Who knows what the next flight master will bring. But in my own collection, I'm gonna have it for another five, 10 years without a shadow of doubt. It's been incredibly dependable. My go-to uh, beta watch. But anyway, guys, I'm gonna stop rabbiting on and I want to hear your thoughts on it. If you are a flighty owner, what are your favorite things? What are your least favorite things about it? It's also getting pretty cold and I'm gonna wrap it up and go back indoors. But yeah, do share that in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, guys, I will catch you in the next one. Okay, guys, ciao. This is a public service reminder for the good gentry. Please follow us on Instagram, join the Facebook UGWC group, and click on the bell to keep notified of new videos. Don't forget to keep it positive, keep it gentry, onwards and upwards. Thank you.